welcome to this edition of Backstage Pass with Leah Chang. Manhattan Theatre Club has extended the critically acclaimed Broadway premiere of the Pulitzer Prize winning Cost of Living. Written by Martina Mayock and directed by Obie winner Joe Bonney at MTC's Samuel J. Friedman Theatre through Sunday, November 6th. The cast features acclaimed original stars Greg Mazgala and Katie Sullivan, who reunited for the Broadway production, Tony Award nominee Kara Young, and David Zayas. Winner of the 2018 Pulitzer Prize, Martina Mayock's powerhouse play received its Broadway premiere after a celebrated run at MTC Stage One. I sat down with Martina and Katie in the Coles Family Patron Lounge at the Friedman to chat about the show and their latest projects. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So if you were going to describe this play to someone, how would you describe it? I, I tell them that it's, that it's about care and it's about breaking out of isolation and trying to join the world that you live in, which is taken from an Andre Dubuse quote that's really meaningful to me. It's in the, it's in the beginning of the play. Um, in terms of the story that, you be, that you're watching, it's, it's a story of two, two couples, two pairs of couples. Um, one, one of those couples is Eddie and Ani. Eddie is an unemployed truck driver. Um, who uh, begins caring for his estranged ex-wife and, the, and in the process how those two people come back together. And the other couple is John and Jess and John is a PhD graduate student at Princeton in political science who has cerebral palsy and he hires as his caregiver Jess who is a first generation um, immigrant who just graduated from um, the same college for undergrad and is dealing with some some like financial precarity and other surprise aspects of, of her life in her life um, and it's also how they uh, kind of transcend their their various differences and um, uh, their story deals a lot with privilege um, and also kind of come together so it's so it's and then and then they these these four people and these two storylines converge at the end um, play plays with time a little bit um, it's kind of ghosty it's kind of sexy, it's kind of funny, uh, and, um, and emotional. And, uh, and I hope you see and it everybody out there. Nice <laughs> see it. Congratulations on your Broadway debuts. Thank you. Feel? It's amazing, it's a dream come true. I think being a theater kid growing up, and kind of this is, I'm sorry, but this is the Super Bowl. There is nothing, <laughs> beyond this that you strive for as an actor. And I think that sort of real live, uh, you fall on your face or you fly kind of thing is what makes the live theater so exciting. Now, Martina, when did you first write this play? I started writing it in 2014. The first pieces of it were in 2014. And um, our the characters and stories kind of came to me uh, as fragments incrementally, and and once I had them over the course of a year, it was a process of trying to figure out what these four people are trying to say to each other. So it was the first production was in 2016, uh, and um, and was that at Williamstown? That was at Williamstown, mm -hmm. yeah. And then we did the MTC off Broadway production in 2017. So it's it's been a while that <laughs> <laughs> I've been with these people, these characters, and the story. Now, I know this story is actually very personal for you. Can you share that? Uh, yeah. In terms of your caregiving background. Yeah, okay. yeah. I used to work as a caregiver when I was living in Chicago for two men with disabilities. Um, and so I pulled from bits of that experience. And um, uh, there's other, there's a lot of the characters are composites of people I know um, and uh, or people I have been. And um, you know, the Jess's background is similar to mine of being, she, she was born in America. Um, I was born, not in America, I was born, born in Poland. And um, that first gen experience is, is uh, close to me. But yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the, the I, I'll watch the play sometimes and it'll feel like a resurrecting of ghosts mm. uh, in a way that's really lovely. Of people that I, that I knew that sometimes, some of them were I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. and when you had your production in 2017 and you won the Pulitzer, and then it was set to come to Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's yeah. <laughs> applaud that. Yeah. Um, and then it was set to come to Broadway, and then the pandemic happened. So what was that like for you 
Yeah, man, that pandemic was not nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I was actually um, directly, more directly hit on Sanctuary City because I was mm -hmm. in previews for that play. Um, we were, I think we were like 10 previews away from opening. At the hotel. At the, yeah, through, through New York Theatre Workshop. Right. Um, when we had to shut that down. So I, I, like cost of living was going to happen you know, for a little further away from that, mm -hmm. and um, when the you know, when the when they first shut everything down, we were like, oh, cool, cool. So I'll see you in like a month, and then it was like, I'll see you in two months. Mm -hmm. And as I think it went through the roller coaster of like hope and then disappointment, and then like hope ignited again, disappointment. Um, and and so after a while, it was nice. It was just more. Um, it felt saner, more healthy to just be like, when it happens, it's gonna be mm -hmm. great. And for now, I'm gonna like hang out with my cat in this apartment and it's <laughs> <laughs> and just like try to stay healthy. So like, but yeah, like many, uh, a lot of things broke and broke open during the pandemic of like, what does it mean? The things that we've been doing with our finite lives, what have we been making? And so um, uh, when we then, when we did then come back, I think. Um, uh, I guess there's residue remnants of the pandemic that you could really feel them in the play because you know the play was written many years before that, but mm -hmm. it was it's a lot of our caregiving and who gets a, a certain level of care and who doesn't, mm -hmm. and um, and the the precarity of the human body and how clo how the many breaks that can affect a human life and so then we all felt this we all experienced this kind of collective collective break. With the pandemic and i think that i've been I, I definitely have felt like it's the play is hitting me hitting me in a different way more kind of more potently and i think i've seen that in audiences as well where where i think that that we're kind of communing with the the breaks and the losses that we've all experienced over mm -hmm. the past few years with through the play as well well i know that this is actually although we've known each other for a couple of years and every time i see you you're getting yet another award <laughs> I see you more <laughs> what are you doing on Wednesday? <laughs> well, and speaking of, you're on you're on Variety's top list of Broadway artists to watch. I think is what it is, and and aren't you set to go off somewhere? Oh yeah, um, I'm about to go to uh, do a residency, uh, writing residency in Sun Valley, Idaho, in the former home of Ernest Hemingway, oh. which like is exciting and also like I'm I so believe in ghosts and so I'm like I <laughs> don't don't know what I what it will be in store for me but right. that's where I'm going for a few days to to um to write and see what happens see what I write and are you working <laughs> is it on a new project that you're working on or I'm gonna be catching up on a film that I have to finish by the end of the month so okay. I'll have like 10 days um and if the director is listening it's so not his film I swear um, <laughs> it's super done. Um, uh, and then also being in a space where I'm gonna, I, I'm not gonna be with anybody. I'm by myself, and um, I am gonna see what I encounter. I mm -hmm. think that in New York, there's a lot of there's in my normal life and everything. There's just there's 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 the act of living, and so mm -hmm. I'm gonna step away from that and see what is there, and then probably, hopefully, make something make something of that. But it's a yeah, I have to go away to to kind of to go go away to find myself and mm -hmm. see who I am right now and make something of that. So and and, and, and also meet my deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I know I I've talked to a lot of writers who have said it's impossible for them to finish anything unless they have a deadline. Like I'm not the, I I sometimes deadlines are completely uh, if I know what I'm doing if I have to like it's uh, adaptations are easier I think for me where it's like. I know what the source material is, and mm -hmm. I have to make a choice about like the direction that I'm going with it. Right. But, but like, give me a deadline, but I have I'm not able to. There's some block within me that. When I saw the first preview, and I was so fortunate to be seeing it from the front row, what hit me was how visceral it was, mm -hmm. but the beauty of all the humanity on stage, and I know that you've also making you're making history with this play, can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I was not aware of this little uh, new line in my bio <laughs> until it was my publicist actually. They were like, are you aware that you're the first 
a actress who is an amputee to ever be on Broadway. And it, it makes sense because I know I don't have anyone to point to, but I was also like, it is 2022. <laughs> that is absolute bananas. Right. Like that is, it, it's, it, it, it feels like it's way past time, but it also feels, I mean, obviously incredibly humbling and, um, I don't, t I don't take that lightly. It's not something you can hoist on your back and carry on stage with you. You have to leave all that stuff in the wings because that's not helpful. But, um, I can't tell you how many people who, uh, audience members have come. I've seen so many young people with disabilities coming to see this show and stopping us and saying thank you know to me this one girl was like I really am interested in acting um and I just never thought it was possible this was kind of possible and I was like please don't give up mm -hmm. I was like keep at it study go to class go to a university I was like but don't give up and um you know it's a it's a an incredibly um, cool, amazing honor, but also like, come on y'all, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So can we talk about who Ani is? Oh gosh, I mean, it's so interesting to hear Martina talk about sort of how, how long we've been working on this play and how long, and at this point, it really genuinely feels like visiting an old friend. I mean, she is, uh, so witty and so, um, uh, just bold and delicious to, to play and hang out in her skin. And at the same time, the things that intimidate me about her still to this day are her vulnerability, um, what she's actually gone through and having to kind of take a deep breath and roll out on that stage every night is without my prosthetics on, which is, you know, how I identify, I guess that's kind of what you would say. Um, it it's it makes me feel, you know, it's like being naked. Right. You know, There's another like another layer of vulnerability. Incredible layer of vulnerability. And what I think one of the things that's so brilliant about Martina's writing um, in this piece is we as a society are sort of taught to look away from, you know, oh, person in a wheelchair, oh you know, someone sleeping in a car. Oh, we look away, we don't engage. Um, and in this particular piece, the audience job is to sit and stare. And you are confronted by these things and you, you can't look away. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so impactful, but the brilliance of the writing comes in the humor. Because the first thing someone sees is a person in a wheelchair and everyone goes, uh, what do we, you know, even if it's not frontal lobe, I, there's a sense of like pulling back and I feel it. I feel it every night. And then the first thing out of my mouth is a joke and it breaks the ice. And I feel collectively like the whole audience sort of lean in a little bit and they're like, okay, well, she's funny. <laughs> and that, you know what I mean? So like, it's, um, it is, it's, people having to confront the idea of their mortality and their, um, you know, we're all sort of, everybody at some point is going to have something that they're going to be dealing with. We're all temporarily able-bodied <laughs> until we aren't. And so um, it's confronting. Sometimes they give you physical therapy homework. Like what? Like try to move. <laughs> <laughs> they do say I should listen to music. See, I was trying to tell you that. So you'll do that. It's not do play. that. It works. I don't know how they don't explain it in the video, but just I'm listen to I'm about to, to say me. some shit to you, Eddie, and I want you to hear it, okay? So here's a notice, an advanced fucking that I'm about to say some shit I want you to hear, okay? You listening? Yeah. Don't interrupt me. Yeah, okay, go. I'm sorry. But sad. you want the music. I'm sad. You don't want the music. I am sad. And pissed. And I'm gonna be sad. 
pissed and sad for however long. I am pissed and sad, and that's fine. Yeah, I feel like feeling whatever I feel right now in my paper bag, and that's fine. There's no recovery from this. My spinal cord shattered. This is it. And I know you know that, so please just don't, okay? I can mail you your shit. I mean, <laughs> not me. I can't fucking, but somehow I, your shit will be mailed. The nurse can mail them. I'll consider that box for my face. Are you listening? How can you be sad with this? Ding, ding, ding. Ding, 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 ding. Be sad. More than anything, it's it's about having access to um, as as individuals that live their life from this perspective with disabilities, having access to tell our own stories and to tell a story maybe about a uh, I've never seen a story about what it was like for me to be dating. Like there's all sorts of craziness that happens, and I think that. Um, Again, it's more about like how living in a world that's not really created with you in mind, <laughs> adapting to that world, and then um, you know the hilarity that ensues. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I just finished last year. I was uh, in the reboot of the Showtime series Dexter: New Blood, and um, what a crazy experience to shoot a TV show during COVID. Was it um, your first TV show? No, I've, I've, it was, and you know what, I will say this, it was my first series that I felt like I was part of the cast. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah. everything else was like, one episode here, one episode there, you know, do you ever see these people again? <laughs> like that kind of thing. And, um, and, and with Dexter, I actually genuinely felt like I was, I was, a part of something, a part of a team making something together, which was really exciting. And um, I thought it was a really well-written, fun, tight season, and it was exciting. And um, and I was a big fan of the original series. So my first day on set and my whole scene was with Michael C. Hall. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was so nervous that first day. I was like, oh my God, I, I called my manager that night and I was like, they're going to fire me. It was terrible. And he was like, I'm sure you are losing your mind. But, so um, hitting those 10% of business. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yes. A hundred percent. That is, well, that is, just call you. it's, it's therapy. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Please don't, yeah, please don't try to quit yeah. the job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 So that's, it's aired. Yeah. So it's, it is aired and, so uh, people can watch it. Wait. Yeah. On, um, on Showtime, um, Showtime anytime. And, uh, <laughs> they, uh, you know, it's the, I mean, you could go way deep and, and start Dexter from the beginning, but my character is just in the reboot. Um, but a fun fact also, kind of weird small world thing, uh, is David Zayas, who plays my Eddie, um, was a series regular on the original season, series, and um, makes, a, makes a little cameo, some little, oh. some little came cameos in this. So we oh, knew each awesome. other. <laughs> yes, it totally was. And actually, there's a whole like fan, you know, fandom on, on, online, and they were like, we want to see a a Batista Esther spinoff yeah, and yeah. I was like yeah let's do it let's do it so who what is um who is Esther oh my goodness Esther is uh she is the so my um Dexter finds himself in a we meet up with him about 10 years after the series the original series ended he's in a super tiny town in um upstate New York and uh kind of living the life of someone who maybe has gone through like 
sobriety, like one day at a time, not killing anybody. Oh. It's sort of like he's even like crossing days off of the like calendar. <laughs> and um, and uh, my character is the local police. She works in the police station. She's the dispatcher, but uh -huh. she's also the town gossip and. Uh, oh, a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, my nails, my hair was teased <laughs> out of control. It took me about six months to like get it Good back, damage. yeah, <laughs> to like grow the damage out. <laughs> but it was, gosh, what a what a fun. And one of the reasons I was super excited about doing that show was Esther is it. It's not a the fact that she was an amputee is not a plot point. It's not emotional manipulation for the audience. It's not a tragic accident or anything like that. We never talk about it. It's never brought up. She's just a person with a job. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that I want to see more of. Why can't that lawyer on the TV sh on this TV show be a, you know, sitting in a wheelchair? Why can't this person be deaf or, you know, right. visually impaired? Like why do we have to make you know, why can't the real world, why can't our entertainment reflect more of the real world? Well, we had that same thing with Asian Americans. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, any marginalized group in Hollywood specifically and also, you know, just any in the entertainment business at all. At some point, you kind of start going, <laughs> hello, <laughs> we're here. So do you feel, this is, goes back to what you were, uh, talk, you were talking about before we started rolling, that that question was addressed. So this woman in our one of our talkbacks uh, asked us if the marketing for this show was um, purposefully vague, and I and I thought it was kind of interesting. And I think since we've had marketing done a number of times yeah. on different productions, there were conversations about what does this play about? Like, what do we want people to see and know before they come and. I think, um, you know, when someone, again, when someone sees a wheelchair, they, you immediately make all these assumptions about what it is and what it's going to be and how it's going to make you feel. Um, and so in the marketing for this particular production, n none of that is seen. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, none of the productions we haven't had a wheelchair. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I don't think it was purposefully vague. I just think that this play if you at the core of it it's a show about connection and trying to people coming together and people falling apart and what causes that it's told through this lens but it is a story about humanity and and, and um i think if you can get people to come and put their butts in the seats they will walk away glad that they did yeah, my intention was never like, oh, I'm going to write a play about disability because I don't know how you write a play about this. I don't know how you write a play about women or about immigration. Like, I don't know that all, and there are su there's such a vastness with all that. Also, that is like not my, that is not my perspective mm -hmm. to, be, to be writing from. Like, I, I was a caregiver and so there's, there's, there's that aspect of it. But like, I didn't want to, um, say like this is this is a play about, yeah about disability and so putting like there, there's also two characters who are first gen or Im Im immigrants or two women like there's all there's 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 various identities and perspectives and life experiences that the characters occupy mm -hmm. that that do inform some aspects of the plot yeah sure in the same way that like mo a lot of our identities inform aspects of our of our, of our, of our lives mm -hmm. but it was mo it was more about them coming their their isolation their loneliness breaking out of that care caregiving really is as, as a, a theme in in a in kind of a, 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 a broad sense of what that what that right. means mm -hmm. care, um, but I, yeah I never felt like that's when we had conversations like early on of we were talking with Greg a lot where Greg was like we can't have a wheelchair we can't have a wheelchair because um, I mean he, he exactly what you said like people have these assumptions about what that story is going to be. Mm -hmm. And at least in my experience, like there was for, for like, I guess like pop culture sto stories of, of um, characters with disabilities, there's, there, there are two types, both of which are kind of distancing and limiting mm -hmm. for, 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 um, for, for that, for that like, identity, for that life experience. One is the like, 
Dying with Dig Dignity narrative, where it's about a character who uh, becomes disabled, who wants to then kill themselves. And that is, that just doesn't feel like, it, so there's, there's that, and there's then there's the like, um, noble hero mm -hmm. saint character who is an inspiration for everybody um uh who does something remarkable and they they have a disability and then both and and either either the person who who just wants to end like those are true stories but they're the only two stories that are the that are the, the most popular that keep kind of being proliferated it feels like a, it feels dishonest because of the lack of something else right um, and and so I guess like when we were first starting, it was like we it's not going to be one or the other. It's not going to you're you're saying before, but like seeing seeing a uh, seeing a person, seeing a character with a disability is kind of confronting one's own mortality. Mm -hmm. And like yes, yes, and yes, and that there's um, we wanted to keep it we wanted to keep it open to for people to um, not come in with that 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 prejudice. Um, they confront that pretty quickly in the play mm -hmm. and get disarmed. Hopefully, they get they get their um, we sub we subvert their expectations of what the story is gonna is gonna be. Um, uh, but yeah, it's like these images are really are really potent. Mm -hmm. They communicate a certain thing that is that is itself potentially a perpetuating of a dishonesty and a limitation of of those of those stories that we just didn't want to do. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, she get. seemed happy. She seemed happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually kind of a wonderful feeling because it feels. I had, I had a, a person come up to me and tell me that the, they found the play very healing. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not gonna tell his story, but he, you know, he's he he um, suffered an almost loss, like very close to losing mm -hmm. the dearest person um, through for medical um, complications. And there was something about going through the experience of this play that that he, he found very very healing, and and I've gotten responses um, in, in in that are more that are more like um, uh, uh, collective than, than like oh this is a that, that are more less about craft and oh those the, like we're difficult experience those those on stage, um, it's more about all of us. Mm -hmm.